everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You are listening to It's All About Food. Thank you for joining me. We're going to be taking a little journey today to Great Britain, specifically to the Royal Botanical Gardens. I have with me Jenny Linford, the editor of the new Kew Gardens cookbook. Jenny Linford is a food writer and author of 15 books, ranging from cookery to ingredient guides. She has written for The Guardian, The Times, Time Out, and the British Library's Food Stories website. Born in London, her interest in food stems from living as a child in Singapore and Italy, places where good food is important to the community, both taken for granted and relished as a great pleasure. I'm so glad you could have this moment to join me. Jenny, welcome. Oh, thank you. It's lovely to be here. I have the privilege of receiving books from the University of Chicago Press from time to time, and they always fascinate me because they focus on very interesting details about food from time to time. And I discovered the Q Pocket books on, I guess the newest editions are on herbs and spices and fruit, and they have just the loveliest drawings. Yes. I'm a big fan of plants. And I really think they should be at the top of any food chart. I think we're discovering this scientifically and healthfully and environmentally how important plants mm -hmm. are. Some even feel that plants are in charge here and that we are working for them. So you have this new cookbook out and it is all about celebrating plants. Tell me how that book got started and also about the Royal Botanical Gardens. Well, it was a wonderful project to be involved in because as a Londoner, I, I love Kew Gardens, which is the most beautiful place that does remarkable work. But I knew it initially, you know, as a child, I was taken there um, to wander around the grounds and in the hot houses and the most extraordinary Victorian architecture. Um, and the project was linked, Kew Gardens, very much part of their work is to try and protect biodiversity, to stop, you know, it's been lost at an alarming rate. A Kew are doing so much to try and to halt it and to record and to preserve biodiversity. Um, and the cookbook was part of a project. They had a, um, a Food Forever festival this summer, um, which started in May and is probably going to end in October, um, summer 2023, um, which was literally about biodiversity and a very important theme. You know, really what they wanted to say to people is we, you know, what's alarming is there are thousands of edible plants in the world but 60% of our calories come from just three crops, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and those, that's, you know, maize, rice and wheat. And we're reliant on this very narrow spectrum, the way agriculture has gone. And in an age of, of climate change and in an age where the global population is expanding, these are, you know, this is serious because the crops that we depended on are under threat. They can't adapt to the climate, to the you know, the condition, the growing conditions are bad. They're being, you know, it's either too hot or too dry or there's storms, there are new diseases emerging. So really what Q wanted to say to people was, you know, we've, we've got to widen what we eat. And so when that was announced, the, the publishing department at Q, because it has its own publishing house, which does do these beautiful books with using their wonderful illustration archive a lot. Um, they thought, well, let's do a cookbook. And what they wanted was a cookbook that celebrated this um, and encouraged people to, to eat plants in a more um, sort of diverse way, I think, and to sort of push the horizons of what you eat. And um, so my brief as the editor was to put this together. I got fantastic contributors by, you know, a real roll call of, of the best food writers in Britain. We've got Yuta um, We've got Ken Holm, who's a very famous Chinese chef. who did so much to promote Chinese food in Britain and also in America too. Um, Asma Khan, who's this incredible Indian chef, um, who was on Netflix, Chef's Table UK. And then and also then other food writers who perhaps aren't household names in those ways, but they're wonderful food writers. And they all donated recipes because the proceeds from the book go to Q. So it's very much a virtual circle where if you buy this book, the money that the book makes goes to, to help Q do its important research work. So I can't really think of a, a better cause, basically. Okay, I didn't even realize that. That's good. Yep. That's really wonderful. Well, the first thing I did when I was looking at this book was I saw the diversity in the recipes. And, and I love that. I'm look, always looking for things that are new to me or a new combination. 
And I definitely saw a lot of them in this book. And that's what was exciting to me. I want to mention these are all vegetarian recipes. There are some vegan recipes. And I think I even may take myself up to the challenge to veganize every one of these recipes. I, I mean, if, yes, they are by wonderful writers. And I'm so glad that that diversity leapt out of the book at you because, and again, that was my brief, you know, because we're reflecting Q. It is a Q Gardener's cookbook. Q work around the world, you know, and plants grow around the world. And so we wanted this. So this isn't a sort of narrow book. It's It's got... You know, it's part of my, the fun for me was um, was finding and putting in these different ingredients. So we have got things, we have got recipes that use, you know, pandan beans, which are very much a, a real classic of Southeast Asian cooking. And that's close to my heart because my mother's from Singapore and I grew up eating puddings that were flavored with pandan, which gives us a lovely, very sort of subtle, quite elusive, hard to describe flavor. I mean, sort of vanilla-y, basmati, rice-ish flavor to, to desserts. Um, you take a long green leaf and you... You often you scrape it with a fork to release the aroma and you knot mm. it tight in the knot and you use it to infuse coconut milk or palm sugar syrups and it gives us love all, all savory dishes too it's used in lots of ways so we've got an amazing um food writer called helen go who works with your tomato lane who's a wonderful baker she gave the most elegant pandan chiffon cake recipe in there and then we've got you know recipes using ethiopian teff which is this tiny very important grain We've got shiso leaves, you know, which are used in Japan, um, paired with mushroom lard, which is a sort of time for So you, anyway, I won't go on because it's very boring, but, but basically you can tell that there was a real richness and, and diversity to the content, to the recipe content. It's funny because I highlighted a few recipes that I want to talk about, and you just mentioned them. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We're very like-minded, and that's not any communication. <laughs> But there were there were quite a few more. I, I found myself, OK, I'm like highlighting almost every other re recipe here. This is I got to get a little more particular. But I want to just get back to the mission behind the gardens and what you mentioned about the three most eaten foods: maize, which is corn, folks here in the United States, maize, rice and wheat. And what fascinates me is these three foods all have problems today. Yeah. That are affecting us at a a deep level. So we have wheat and wheat has nourished humanity for such a long time. And now due to a number of things, hybridization and monocropping and glyphosate in Roundup, mm. <laughs> we have serious gut issues when we consume wheat. And this is scary. You know, such mm. a staple that has fed humanity for so long is now harming us. We need to do something about that. I mean, you're right. There's such a massive issue really with, industri you know, the industrialization of food production and what's happened to it. And I think one of the concrete ways that Q is working on that, which was really fascinating for me was to, to you know, I had the privilege in a way of, you know, researching this for the book, is that Q have got a seed bank at Wakehurst. And this is a wild, um, wild plants seed bank, Svalbard, which is, is the other very, very famous global seed bank, and that keeps crops, seeds of crops. I mean, you can understand, even the term seed bank, everyone can understand what that is. It's like you take seed, you keep it, and you're keeping it for that future before it goes. Because, I mean, we're losing, you know, at an alarming rate. Plants are being lost around the world. Um, so this act of recording, which has always been very central to Q, is really essential. Um, and so at Wakehurst, they keep crop wild relatives, which is really fascinating. So these are the the plants that were the ancestors of the crops that, as you rightly say, we grow now. Um, and the hope is that they will have traits that we need, that they've got some, perhaps they'll have a resilience to a disease that we don't even know about that's down, coming down the road towards us, you know, and, um, or perhaps they're very good at dealing with drought. You know, they might have been out of favour because perhaps they didn't yield in large amounts. Mm -hmm. So commercially discarded. And as you, I mean, some if you know, you know, um, seed companies has become pretty controlled and globalized and narrowed down basically really and so these banks of this having this resource information where these are seeds that can then be taken and grown and Q work very closely so they will you know they will work with 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 breeders with plant breeders give them access allow them to take these away experiment try growing them how does that go is that going to help you will that give you better yield will that you know will it bear up against drought or against is it, can it take a lot of rain? Because you know, now we get a lot of rain in a very short space of time. Um, what, you know, is there something that we need to keep? So that's whole act of preserving that information. It's so interesting. I mean, at Q, they got a herbarium 
which was this extraordinary collection of started up in the 19th century, which was very much an age you know, of collecting and bringing in and putting under roofs. Um, Herbarium has all these preserved specimens of vascular plants. And what's fascinating now is thanks to gene technology, if, for example, there was research under coffee, you know, a rubber coffee is under threat. It's not coping very well with climate change at all. Mm. You know, coffee sustains people's livelihoods. Not, not, not only just the fact that, you know, we need it to drink it in the morning to get going. It, it's people make their living by growing coffee. Yeah. So, um, so we need, you know, a coffee variety that, that is better, that can cope with climate change. And there was one that was cultivated. It fell to favour because it wasn't so productive. They tried to take it down in the wild. There's very little bit left. Then that is, have we found the right one? How do we know we found the right one? Went off to Kew, went to the barium, found that recorded entry, were able to, you know, check the DNA, which is the joy of technology nowadays. You go, oh, yeah, we have found this. Wow. So this is the one that people loved and people were growing and liked, you know, in the 19th century that's fallen out of favour, but might be a useful alternative. Wow. I love hearing about this herbarium. I didn't even know there was such a name until I read this book. <laughs> And fungarium, <laughs> fungariums. Yes, yes fungarium, yeah, I know, Q is fascinating. And, the, you know, and millions of specimens. And the statistics about Q are really mind-boggling. It just is sort of world-leading in so many ways. And back to maize, rice, and wheat. Maize has a problem. I know in Mexico, they have so many varieties of corn. And yet, thanks to genetic modification and monocropping, a lot of those varieties are getting contaminated with mm. this ge genetically modified variety. And a lot of people have allergies to corn as well. And then rice, mm, rice has, <laughs> has its own issues where a lot of varieties now have concentrations of arsenic thanks to the chicken fertilizers that we put on them that are contaminated with arsenic because mostly because of factory farming, because we give the chickens arsenic to keep them from getting sick because they're so crammed together. Everything is linked together. That's why I call the show, It's All About Food. Very good, yeah. <laughs> These important foods, mace, rice, and wheat are all struggling. And it's so important, the work that the Royal Botanical Gardens is doing and possibly will assist us in the future with some of our favorite foods. I, th I think what's quite interesting, really, in a way, if you think of, you know, the commercial demands, of, you know, obviously, you know, crops are grown to be sold, so you need a market for that crop. So how do you make that? You know, so that's what's sort of fascinating is that we could be eating so much more widely. So the whole catch-22 thing is, if, you know, if something's not sold, I as a consumer can't buy it and eat it. So, but a grower has to think that someone's going to buy it and eat it. So really, you know, this is why this message in this cookbook, in a, you know, hopefully a really appetising, beguiling form is... You know, why don't what you eat? Why don't you try, you know, try a different grain, try a flour that's not wheat flour. Why don't you try rye flour or barley flour? Or, you know, so they're wonderful recipes. That was the joy of working with such fantastic food writers. People, very, people don't really realize how much skill and knowledge goes into writing a good recipe. It's a real, it is a skill. And the knowledge that someone who writes a good recipe has is, is deep. You know, it's quite a lot of time and practice. Um, and so I just went to the people I think, you know, they were the best food writers I picked up. I admired them all and got their recipe. And that was what was lovely about it was being able to put together this really eclectic collection, which I think the fun of it really in a way is when you look through that book and you've got grains, but the grains have been used in different ways. So there's a wonderful um, Australian baker called Dan Leopard has got um, a marmalade grain tart, which uses different flowers in the in the base and then has it's got whole grain which is cooked and softened which is very much a sort of a medieval tradition of putting those grains into into sweet desserts um sort of tarts mm. and it's it's a marmalade grain tart and it's such a delicious um we served it at Q. we had a patron's dinner with a menu based on the cookbook and they served dan's tart there and it was just and it just went out really well <laughs> it was absolutely mm. huge. So, you know, it's, but the point is that, you know, we, you know, as consumers, we have got power because if we, you know, if we shop in ethical ways, if we make choices, if we seek out and we buy and we support and we make a market, that, that sort of can impact, you know, quite profoundly. Absolutely. That's, that's my passion. I believe that we can solve most of the world's problems with our food choices and the result is all wins for all of us because we'll be healthier, we'll be treating the environment better. And the food is so delicious. The variety is amazing. 
and the combinations, it's infinite. Anyway, I get really excited about it. Uh, So you have a number of different sections in the cookbook. I thought we'd jump to that. You start with herbs and spices. And I always wonder uh, how people choose the order of their cookbooks and the combinations in the table of contents. That always fascinates me. I love that you started with herbs and spices. Not only do they impart so much flavor, and it's kind of fun because there's so much adventure and romance involved with herbs mm-hmm. and spices, how we've gone all over the planet to discover them and everything that's been related to them, some very positive and some not so because colonialism, what? unfortunately, <laughs> is linked to spices. Uh, but we're discovering their medicinal properties. You mentioned in the book that Q is working on some of that as well. Yes, it was interesting. I mean, yes, because my job, you know, in a way it was quite disparate. I had to collect over 60 recipes from different contributors and, and put a shape on it. And, and we, you know, we knew it would be vegetarian. And so that was one thing. But, you know, if you just write to someone who's got hundreds of recipes, I want a vegetarian recipe, they're like, well, you know, what? <laughs> and so, so I came up with these broad, um, section which is a plant-based section so it's herbs and spices grains and pulses grouped together in a way from a culinary point of view rather than from a botanical point of view and herbs and spices you're right I think I put that at the beginning because for me they are they're very exciting I think it is remarkable how just a little you know a little pinch of a spice can transform a whole dish you know one clove added into some rice one little cinnamon stick as you cook it will perfume that dish you know one bay leaf Starting, I remember I was, um, I, 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 we bought a house and the builders were working in our kitchen and I was cooking a meal and the old boy came and he said, what are you, what are you cooking, Jenny? And I said, well, I'm making tomato sauce, I've got onion and garlic. And he said, no, no, something else. And I said, oh, a, ba- a bay leaf. And he said, a bay leaf. He said, I never knew it would make, he'd never cooked the bay leaf. He said, I didn't know it would make that difference. And he could smell it, you know, it was amazing. So I just love that, that power, you know, for me it's that, that potency that plants have, you know, if you think of, tiny seeds and what they have within them and you know the goodness that they have within them and I think again so for herbs and spices that's partly why I put it so I put that at the beginning and then I ended with fruits and nuts because in a way that's more because often they're sweet and some of the most of those recipes are sweet though all the sections I've got a mix of sweet and savory recipes through them which again is part of that sort of the fun you know of thinking outside the box why don't I have a beetroot cake you know you don't have to just have beetroot as a savory vegetable you can have it you know, or parsnip in a cake. You can have that, you can do that. What I love about herbs and spices, if they are applied subtly, not overbearing, so that you're tasting something and it's really quite pleasing. And you're, what is that? Just like you mentioned with the bay leaf. And I like to play that game sometimes. Sometimes it can, I'm obsessed and it drives me nuts. (laughs) What is that I'm tasting? And then you realize it. I I think I remember the first time Somebody gave me something that had ginger and tomato in it. And I mm-hmm. couldn't quite, what is that? It's, I like it, but I don't know what it is. And then ginger and tomato. Mm. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, I mean, ginger is wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, you know, herbs and spice, you know, all the cuisines, we use herbs and spices, you know. So it was that sense of, you know, it just allows you to, to touch on, mini cuisines and bring them together and put them in in a section um in in one section in that way so that was really yeah really satisfying i'm going to pick out a recipe now fish fragrant aubergine yes that's that's eggplant everybody aubergine is eggplant (laughs) thank you for the interpreting (laughs) (laughs) and there's no fish in here and so i saw the fish fragrant is that a, a phrase that's used or that's something you came up with yeah, that is a phrase that's used in Chinese cooking. And it's quite like fish. everyone literally, you know, all the editors gone, oh, you've got a recipe with fish in it. I'm like, no, 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 no. Just read, yeah, no, it's literally, it's the same, you know, it's the flavorings that are used with fish in Chinese cooking, but used with aubergine. This is from Fisher Dunlop, who's one of the great, who's English, but a great writer of Chinese, great sort of recorder, really, of Chinese food and cooking. Writes very well and very beautifully about it. And is very respected and gave us, that recipe, which is an absolutely delicious recipe. I mean, we, um, on the, the shoot for the book, we were, you know, obviously we're making recipes and we wanted a no waste policy. So we ate everything that was shot. And that was one of them. And it was a really eclectic, hilariously eclectic mix of dishes <laughs> at one meal, you know, because, because they were so diverse. But um, yeah, and everything was, you know, it was like, oh, these are all really delicious. So that was quite satisfying. Lots of mm. cake. There are lots of quite wonderful cakes in the book and desserts so yeah (laughs) yeah so I'm going to jump to the pumpkin and sage cake 
Yes. I can't speak for anyone else, but I know a lot of people, if they cook, they only make like five dishes <laughs> and yeah. it's really uncomfortable to kind of step out of that. And I'm always encouraging people, find your kitchen, buy herbs and spices, experiment, use cookbooks, and you don't have to follow them exactly once you get familiar with what you're doing. And I love sage. And I love the idea of putting it in a cake. Good. And that's why I'm very pleased. I mean, you're right, it is, it is an unusual thing. But again, from a very talented and clever young food writer who, who won a prize for, you know, for her recipe writing this year, um, and it's just that it was literally that was the brief of the book to to try and one of the things I enjoyed about it was just this sense that perhaps you know to try and get the adventure. In fact, rather like you, I'm probably always telling people, you know, be open minded. I think it's partly I, I did have a very travelled childhood, so and I yeah, and living in Singapore and Italy, which got very rich food cultures, but very different food cultures. I lived in Tuscany, in Florence, in Italy, which was yes. Well, that's wonderful as that sounds. I went to the American School of Florence there for three years. So that was another, you know, whole new experience as well. But I mean, Tuscan Italian food is intensely regional. So we just ate Tuscan food, you know, they, they don't eat, you know, you wouldn't eat foods from the Veneto, you wouldn't eat foods from Rome, you're in Tuscany, they're Tuscan dishes, this is it. Singapore's got a more complex history with, a, you know, a community that's predominantly Chinese, but also has Malaysian communities, got four national languages, and a Tamil Indian community. It's got some hybrid cuisines called, called Nonya, which is a Chinese Malay community. So it's very complex and diverse. And it's not Chinese uniform, it's regional. You know, so you, you wouldn't go out for a Chinese meal, you'd go out for a Hainanese meal or a Cantonese meal or a, a Pekin, you know, the, that's the level of food was rich and diverse. So I think I always grew up with this, I think, well, A, I grew up eating a huge range of things. And, you know, I wasn't someone who cooked. I started cooking at university. But when, when I did start cooking, I think I was just prepared to try things. And I just got cookbooks and bought them and tried, you know, and sort of had my disasters, but was never put off by that. Because I just I used to say to people, you know, you wouldn't really expect to learn a language like that. You put in time, don't you? Same thing with cooking. It, the more you do it, the better. Because I can't cook. And I said, well, you know what? If you the more you do it, the better you get. That's literally it. You learn, you understand, you, you know to turn the temperature down or when the oil is hot enough to put, add something if you want to fry it. Well, you know, all those little touches that you do as you learn to cook. I am thinking this, there's a good note here for parents of young children, the importance of introducing them to a variety of foods so that they know how to try foods as they're growing older and also get them in the kitchen so they start learning cooking oh. techniques early. I did that with my son and I always got to, you know, to find, you know, find spices for me. And I was going, oh, you know, find me the cardamom. And then we'd always smell, I'm a great one for, you know, I love, I love aromas. I'm always like, mm. oh, sm sm smell, taste this baby, smell that precious cardamom. And it's fun, you know, get kids love, you know, little pestle water, crushing a spice, you know, that's fun for that's a four-year-old. Right. Then, it may not be as much fun for the adult to crush the spice. <laughs> it's like, oh, I got to crush this now. <laughs> And, you know, and you're wash, washing rice with your, you know, so I brought my son up, you know, with me in the kitchen. I have, and he's now young, he's 26, but, you know, he enjoys cooking. He's got a very uh, stressful job and how he relaxes is, is by cooking and the satisfaction it takes of putting a meal together. I was reading an article, I think it was in The Guardian this week, and I, I'm just remembering it now, so I don't remember who wrote it. The gentleman who wrote it was talking about how the United Kingdom is not really known for its food or it's a stereotypical kind of concept. You know, we think of France and Italy for certain kinds of foods. And, but he said, after traveling around and going, like you said, certain regions of Italy, they, they only serve certain things and you go from one restaurant to another and the menus are very similar. And the same thing in French restaurants. I see the French restaurants here in New York City and the menus are the same as I see in France. But when you go to London, you have all of this variety, all of these different cuisines from all over the world. And that makes eating wonderful. Yeah, it does. I mean, I'm, and I think in that sense, you know, if you think of Q as, as a part of London, I think the book in its diversity reflects that because that is one of the richness that, that London has is, you know, London is a very multicultural city. Um, you know, it's big, it's prosperous, it's got different people have come and settled here for centuries from different parts of the world, bringing with them their food. And a lot of my work as a food writer over the decades has been actually, I was 
an early charter of those communities, a book called Food Loves London, written pre-internet. I explain that to young people. They, they can't even understand the concept. And I say, you know, I couldn't type in Malaysian food shops, Polish food shops, Jewish food shops. I had to talk to people because information was either written down. You know, I wrote to people. I wrote to legendary cooks like Claudia Roden, who's this wonderful Middle Eastern cook, seminal book on Middle Eastern food published in Britain, and who's also given, very kindly gave recipe to the Q book. I wrote and said, Claudia, where do you, you know, I'm doing a book on food shop, where would you buy middle English ingredients from? And she wrote back. And then I went off to Edgeware Road and saw this beautiful Lebanese food shop with its nut counter with about 20 different types of, of nuts, including pistachios in ways I'd never, you know, lemon pistachios I'd never come across. And just some beautiful, sophisticated, beautiful pastries. And yeah, well, you know, just wonderful worlds. And that's what London has, this sort of richness, this cosmopolitan richness within it, which, you know, yeah, it's, it, which is very lovely. Another recipe I'm going to bring up is the fool. Oh, yes. Uh, I am nuts over fava beans and the Middle yeah. Eastern way to prepare them with garlic and parsley. Your recipe, of course, has a side of hard boiled eggs. I'm going to leave them off the table, <laughs> but, the, but I, I just, Love fool. I don't see it enough. I get so excited when I see it on a Middle Eastern restaurant menu. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it surprises me because I think the best, I've spent some time in Israel. I haven't been to any of the other Middle Eastern countries. And in fact, I went vegan in 1988 in Israel. Yeah. Right. Because I knew there would always be hummus. I was going to say that. I think you might <laughs> But there was also fool. Uh, and some of the best fool I've ever had was actually outside of Chicago. So it can really surprise you where you find things. Yeah, it can. And that recipe for Fool Madame is, is um, by a food writer called Nikki Segnett, who wrote a, best, a wonderful best-selling book called The Flavor Thesaurus, which looked at flavors. It wasn't a cookbook. It was a book that explored the idea of flavor in a very sort of witty and stylish and elegant way. And she's a fantastic writer. So I was thrilled to have her in it. And what's fascinating is that the... It, when I was approaching these people writing saying would you give me explaining about the cookbook and would you give us a recipe three of the recipe contributors they chose recipes that with pulses but not just generic pulses they were pulses from a company called Hodmadogs which is an English company that's an old Suffolk dialect word that means something round and curled up and Hodmadogs are championing British pulses because basically we used to eat a lot of pulses in Britain but we, they sort of fell out of favour, partly as we got more prosperous. People, uh, they were seen as the food of the poor and there was a stigma attached to them and people switched to, to sort of meat-based protein. Anyway, that's changing. <laughs> and so, and home dogs are, are brilliant. And I was, just, I was just thrilled that literally of these food writers, three of them had specifically said, Hodma dogs, I'm, I make it with this Hodma dogs pulse because Hodma dogs are growing, particularly the beans. So there's the Carl and pea. There's another recipe in the book. For Hodmadors, Carl and Peas, which is an old, these are old British varieties that have been grown here again. Hodmadors are working with farmers to trial them. So it's really sort of vibrant, which is, goes back to what I was saying about if you create a market and you spread the word and you make an, you know, an interest and appetite for something, it can be very meaningful because it is changing what people are planting and growing and the way that they grow. And it's all about, Hodmadors are all about biodiversity. All right, you brought up the Carlin pea, which was one of my questions. What is a Carlin pea? And you have it in the roasted beetroot, plum, and Carlin pea salad. I yeah. love the idea of plums paired with beets. And then there's this mysterious Carlin pea. Yeah, which is this little, you know, which is mysterious to lots of people in Britain because it's not a mainstream pulse. You know, it, it, was, it was a pea that we used to eat that we then stopped and it's now back again. And it's as if you'd say, yes, it's got a nice and slightly nutty flavor. And the woman who gave that recipe, Jenny Chandler, is a fantastic food writer, wrote a brilliant book called Pulse. She was a champion or she champions pulses and does these great recipes, very accessible. You know, she suggests really sensible things like batch cooking. So if you're cooking from scratch, if you're soaking your dried pulses, which is the most economical way in, in the sense that you know, dried pulses are very cheap to, to buy. So if you soak them and then cook them, um, then you actually you know, batch cook and then keep them in their cooking liquid, cool them and then store them in a Tupperware box in their liquid. And then you can use them through the week in salads, in soups, add them to stews, add them to sauces. They're all there ready. You know, it's that great thing. So you don't have that process. There is a process with cooking from, you know, dry, whole dry pulses, it's not with lentils, but with the whole ones, with the beans and the peas. Well, I don't know if I can find Carlin peas here. I haven't looked yet. I know New York City has everything. 
<laughs> but uh, I may have to bring Carlin Peas back from my London trip. That's a good thought. Yeah, stock it up. Yeah, hold me to the Carlin Peas. Very special, real taste of Britain, that would be. Yeah, exactly. I always go for food souvenirs, you know, typically. So. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at the Karachi Spice Lentil and Potato Bun Kebabs. Mm. Those look tremendously fun. And I absolutely know that I can make a vegan version of that. Yes. Yes. No, that would be, that was delicious. And that was a Pakistani recipe from St. Mm. Miles. And the relish flavor. It's, it's so delicious. And again, just a really sort of nice different way. You know, it's sort of a riff on a, on a hamburger, but you know, it's a meat free riff. It's just got this, it's fun. You know, it's a street food with these different elements um, put together and yeah, and it was really, really delicious to eat. And just, yeah, I just, I love that. So there's sort of a vibrancy to those flavors um, and the pairing. It's like the textures are very satisfying together and the, and the kick that you get from the chutney is like, yum. <laughs> the thing about street food, it can be a wonderful thing and part of any travel adventure. And on the other hand, I'm always cautious about what I'm eating and where it's coming from and is it good for me? And so I appreciate recipes like these so that, I can make some of these foods that I may not be that courageous to try. <laughs> and I can make them with the best ingredients at home. Because I remember once, it may have even have been in Israel, where I bought a falafel, a falafel sandwich on, at one of these street food things. And I think the oil was so old and bad. Oh, that yeah. it, it didn't stay down very long. That's horrible. What a shame. That's a shame. Because it's funny because right. I Yes, I have rosy memories of street food because in Singapore it's a big bit of the culture. These well, well, when I was little were hawker stalls that were mobile, but now have become centralised sort of food courts in a way. With but the, the fascinating thing is that the, the stall holders are specialists, and Singapore's got such a sort of food is so central to life in Singapore that you know you wouldn't last very long <laughs> if you went for if your oil was rancid because <laughs> you just get out of business because the word would spread. So, so it's very competitive, which means the standards are very high and people specialise, you know, in making this one, mm. you know, perhaps noodle dish or, or rice dish or some speciality and they, um, and they get known for it, you know, and work, you know, really hard work, but absolutely delicious and you go along and, and eat it. But isn't it, to go back to your point, where you were saying that, you know, you thought this does, I mean, that's the joy of cookbooks, isn't it? Like cookbooks are portals to other, other worlds of, of delicious food, aren't they? So it's a way in, you can take... So, you know, I can try these things and make them, you know, without, you know, without having been to Pakistan myself, but I get this little taste of Pakistan through following Samaya's recipe. And that's a very exciting thing. I want to jump to your section on leaves. I love that you called it leaves. <laughs> All the cookbooks that I see, we call them greens. Ah, uh, yeah. But Interesting. They're yeah. leaves. I was really trying to get that botanic point across, you know, just mm -hmm. make people think that we eat plants because we've become so separated don't we We become you know we're often very disconnected from our food and where our food comes from and the reality yeah. of it and so I always so every section I wrote about what you know my first point was what those that bit of the plant why does the plant what do they do for the plant you know so leaves are photos, the source of photosynthesis for plants you know and this and this doing this incredible remarkable thing you know of turning sunlight into into energy um and, and just to sort of pause and think about that for a minute, you know, before you absolutely might be a lettuce leaf. <laughs> well, just pausing any time to think about anything is a good idea. Very true. And I'll take a breath. So in your introduction, you talked about some of the work happening at Q, and you talked about researching, is it called Chaya? C-H-A-Y-A. It's Chaya. a tree Chaya. spinach. I'm sorry, Chaya. Yep, so you're right. Yeah. Yes, the and, tree spinach. Uh, I have a friend who's a, a botanist and a farmer, and he's growing some tree spinach in his on his property in California. So he got me to try it. But it's just interesting about how they're researching this plant and how beneficial it can be. It's from southern Mexico and it's very nutritious, has a lot of protein and vitamins, all the things that we want to have. And it's also very tasty and it's supposed to be pest resistant and tolerant of both heavy rain and drought. And, you know, the environment is definitely going that direction. Yeah. More rain in some places and not enough in others. Yeah. Sounds like a lovely plant. I want some in my backyard that I don't have. 
It was fascinating because I also had the privilege of um, being on a panel with one of the scientists at Q, and he's doing research into a plant called NSET, E-N-S-E-T, which I had never heard of. And it looks, it's related to the banana, but, and it's grows in, it's grown in Ethiopia as a food plant, but not for its fruit. It's not, the, the bananas are full of seeds. It's grown for its edible stem and its corn, which is like the underground tuber. Um, and this is really, and it's called the plant against hunger because it, um, it, it can be harvested at any time in its life, which is pretty unusual. It doesn't, you know, there's not a sort of harvest month. We, you know, if, if things were, if you'd run out of food and it would be famine had struck and you know, you would be able to go to that tree and, and, and harvest it and eat it, which is very, very useful. And so, I mean, what's sort of fascinating, it's just this tiny, it's only one part of Ethiopia where it's grown and eaten, but it's really important to obviously, there's a lot of knowledge, you know, really deep knowledge and understanding there, which again, so this Q scientist travels out there, it's about making relationships with people, recording their knowledge, you know, trying to get an understanding and then trying to seek to, to spread that knowledge because potentially that could be a really, really important food source. Um, so yeah, Q, yeah, so Q Gardens, because, you know, it's funny because I think in, Lots of people just go to Kew and, and it is very, very beautiful. They, they look after it immaculately and it's, there's always something to see, you know, the autumn leaves are wonderful, the, the borders plant beautiful flowers. But so you just, you see that very decorative side of Kew, but what you don't really see is the massive amount of work that's behind scenes and hidden away um, that, that is really important. And this research, you know, to try and to record knowledge and to work with people and to understand so, for example, those who are working in Madagascar on the yams, because the wild yams, which there were many historically, they're declining again. They're getting, you know, they're getting, they're becoming extinct, and so they're trying to record um, and persuade and show the people that actually, if they grow their cultivated yams alongside the wild yams, that that works really well because there are lots of sort of benefits in terms of the growing, successful growing of the crops, and that there could be a market for these these other wild yams. And so, just again, so trying to make you know. A commercial reason so which is so I think well that's one of the things I think I, I about Q is that they are trying to work in a very real way you know with the world with the real world it's not an ivory tower it's not knowledge for knowledge's sake it's trying to you know connect in a meaningful way um yes yeah, so really important stuff being done we're talking about the Royal Botanical Gardens and I realize that these are royal gardens these have probably access to just about anything they would want to put in a garden like this and make it spectacularly beautiful. And there are some really beautiful photos in your book, the Aegis Evolution Garden, stunning. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to set foot in it. Can I set foot in it or do I have to like look at it from afar? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's beautiful. And the kitchen garden is really fascinating there because basically the origins of Q is that it was a royal, um, there was a palace at Kew, Kew Palace, and so the origins of Kew, it was that. So it's 1759, wow. Princess Augusta, who's the mother of King George III, founds a nine-acre botanic garden in the sites of the royal gardens at Kew. So she sets up this small botanic garden, and then and that, that grows and grows through the 18th century, which is very much an sort of age of discovery and an age of, sort of scientific exploration and interest. And so it, so it has these sort of royal origins and founded by a woman, which is pretty fascinating, I think. Mm. I mean, it sort of develops, you know, and its growth, you know, as Britain becomes an imperial power, mm. you know, Q plants are coming to Q from around the world. And that Victorian sort of incredible craftsmanship sees these great glass houses, which were feats of engineering, extraordinary sort of construction engineering of their, you know, absolutely extraordinary. Um, like, the, you know, the, they were the largest glass structures of their, of their time being built. Um, so, you, so that's what we've sort of got this this legacy. It's quite fascinating. So you have this, and at some point it was um, open to the public, which is why you know we are able to go, and that's why you'll be able to go and walk around it. It's pretty wonderful. I think gardens in general are beautiful, and I think that when we grow our food, even on farms, their beauty should be a part of it. And unfortunately, we, we we've gotten to a place where capitalism rules. And we want to use every inch of space and we monocrop, grow all the same crops, which is not healthy for the plant. It's not healthy for us. And it doesn't look very nice. And we're learning with organic farming and permaculture that it's important to have wildflowers and native plants that work with the beneficial insects that can help protect the plants that we're growing 
for food. And at the same time, they are stunning. I think nature intended for life to be beautiful. I agree. I totally agree. I'm actually the kitchen gardens at Kew, which is um, built on the site of the historic kitchen gardens that fed the royal family hundreds of years ago. It's a really fascinating place to visit because Helena Duff is the head, the kitchen gardener there. She is doing exactly that. She plants um, in ways to encourage pollinators. To, she's trying to show people, I think, the potential of what can be done. And she's planting a lot of potential future foods like oca, which is this interesting tuber from Peru that, again, could be a potato substitute. It seems to have a lot of disease resistance to it. So she's trying to, and she's, you know, she's experimenting. So it's full of interesting things to look at. And if she's there, she's always really happy to explain what, you know, what something is and why she's growing it and why it's there. And there's, and it's, and it's, and the thing very, you know, I find kitchen gardens very beautiful, like orderliness to them. And that's productivity is very lovely. Um, and this is fully, but this is already stimulating an interesting kitchen garden, which I think is, that's what I love about Kew. I think it's got this great, um, Kew Gardens is such an institution, but it has got this real creative energy to it. And you see it when you meet the people I've been lucky enough to meet people who work there and they've got this great, um, yeah, there's just a very interesting, open-minded set of people. It's fascinating. Page 44, you have the mushroom larb with shiso leaves. We're still in the leaves category. And I remember when I first discovered shiso leaves, they're not that easy to find, but we have Korean markets here in New York City where I can always find them. But I love the flavor. And of course, mm -hmm. anything with mushrooms is a win. Mushroom with shiso leaves. I was excited to see that one. Mushroom larb with shiso leaves. Yes, which is really, it's a very clever riff by, um, oh, so Catherine Phipps, the woman who gave us this, the funeral who gave this recipe, she's written a book called, it's either called Leaf or Leaves, a cookbook. Um, what I loved is there were so many specialists who gave recipes, you know, and and her book celebrates the leaf. And um, and, that, and that pair, what lard was traditionally would be made with, it's a Thai dish, it's a northern Thai dish, and it would be made with, with meat, but so Catherine's on this very clever version with mushroom that works a treat, and it uses rice, which is ground as part, very much as sort of a flavoring, which you dry fry and grind. And you're right, and she said these are not easy to find, even in London, but they can be found, you know, at specialist shops um, and, and online. And it's in fact, you know, the option is if you can't find them, then use lettuce leaves, but they have all this beautiful aromatic flavor that's really quite yeah. special. Yeah, so it's lettuce quite- Lettuce leaves will um, not, will not make it. No, they have their own <laughs> texture and a very fascinating flavor. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, the next one I'm going to bring up, page 45. This makes me smile so much. Lightning leaf iced tea. I rant <laughs> all the time about how tea should be made and how coffee should be made. And I really cannot stand how convenience is king in my yeah. world and everywhere we are and I don't like the tea bag and I don't like the newer tea bags that aren't even in paper but they're in some sort of they make it sound like a silk purse but it's really like a nylon pantyhose quite right <laughs> I so agree with you oh do you know what yes and Timothy Doffe who gave this recipe he would so agree with you because he's got a, a shop in London called Postcard Teas which you must go to because I will Oh, it's so beautiful. It's off, it's in, on a little side street off Oxford Circus. And Oxford Circus is, you know, heavenly busy for the shops. Then just, you know, three minutes away, there's a haven of the most civilised space. Tina Doffley set the shop up, I think, over 10 years ago. And he, to champion leaf teas, he imports them from growers he knows himself. He's travelled, you know, in India and Taiwan and Japan and China and Sri Lanka. And he makes his relationship with very small scale producers. And he absolutely champions quality tea and he is a great believer in in leaf tea and um so he and I wanted tea in the book you know because we have this leaf section you know and and tea is the most consumed beverage in the world so I thought oh. if I'm going to have a leaf section I've got to put tea in it so I approached him and asked if he would share a recipe which he very kindly did and he's exactly that because it's the beauty of making something yourself you know, really simple, and it's very economically, rather than buying, as you say, you know, convenience rules, doesn't it? I spend my life trying to get people to cook from scratch, and um, yeah, it sounds like we've got a very similar approach in that sense. And this is a lovely recipe, because you can, you can use whatever tea you've got, and to make it 
what the way you want it, which is what again Tim would say to you is that if you control the making, you make it your own taste, you know. And it's a and it's a lovely, refreshing drink, which I because we had a very hot summer, I've been making it this summer. Thank you for putting that in there. I had the opportunity to speak with the mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, a few times. And I don't know if you even know his story, but he had diabetes and he ended up adopting a plant-based diet and it just turned all of his symptoms around and and now he's always rocking some fashionable suits and looking really awesome brilliant he talked about drinking green tea preparing it loose like this and even consuming the leaves you know not filtering them now i know most people would want to filter the tea and not have the leaves but the leaves have nutrition in them even after you brew the tea and fiber so you can eat them yeah how fascinating well yes no i mean tin and tea is a most fascinating subject, and Tim knows so much about it. I've heard Tim talk on many occasions, and he's one of those wonderful people who shares knowledge with a generosity. He doesn't want to lecture people, he just wants to tell you and enthuse and share his amazing depth of knowledge. And I mean, a very, he's also the most, one of the most polite people I've ever met. You know, he's just quite remarkable. Okay, the next one I want to highlight is vegan kimchi. I love kimchi. Maybe some people don't realize that it is not always vegan. And when you go to traditional places in Korea to get kimchi, it's very often made with fish flavorings. Yeah. Uh, But it's a wonderful food and it's so good for us. We're starting to realize really the benefit of fermented foods. Yes. For our gut. So important. Yeah. Gut health. That's the way to go. (laughs) The gut is the new frontier. Yes. Yeah. And it's really, you know, we're learning so much about its importance, but we've got so much to learn about how we look after our, our gut well. But one of the things that's, that's been taken away with the industrialization of food, you know, and you think of, of the way that bread making has been speeded up. Yes, it's a whole, <laughs> whole area, which I used to get into my soap box about. But yeah, I'm glad you pleased, I'm glad you pleased there's a vegan kimchi. I thought that's a nice, that was an interesting thing to have put in the book because as you say, it's, kimchi is a wonderful food. It's so tasty and incredibly good for you. So it just felt really nice to be able to put in that Korean, you know, classic, iconic Korean recipe in in a vegan version in in the cookbook. I spent some time in Korea as an engineer in the late 90s. Wow. Yeah, it was really fascinating. I made a lot of trips there. I don't want to go into that story, but (laughs) I did eat a lot of kimchi, but it was hard to find kimchi that wasn't that hard to find. But I I had to make it clear and had this wonderful little book that I bought a long time ago. It looks like a passport and it's called The Vegan Passport. And it describes in like 36 languages what vegans eat. And when you bring it to Asian countries, I think it may be mentioned, I can't read obviously the different languages, but there's a great respect for the Buddhist practices and the religious practices. And so when you show it to them, I I would get a bow and very, very respectful. How nice. Isn't that good? Very open-minded. Which not every, yes, not every countries are. I mean, they must, it is on the rise. I mean, around the world, you know, the move to people eating plant-based food. Um, yeah. And you see people, of course, are seeing a market for it. <laughs> and so therefore, yes, a lot of products are being created, aren't they, especially for the, you know, for the vegan market. So I, yeah. I'm laughing because I've spent a lot of time in France. I lived in France in the 90s. I remember specifically in Paris, not anywhere else. Everywhere else, everyone was respectful, but in Paris, they were not. <laughs> <laughs> I, was kind of, I was thinking of French. <laughs> I just wonder. Yeah. So yeah, I would ask for things in perfect French and they would just like say, no. <laughs> <C'est pas possible. laughs> okay. But that was a long time ago. And I can't wait to get back to Paris and then the rest of France will be there later this month. And there are, there are just so many new restaurants popping up that are plant-based and many are vegan. Uh, I keep thinking I'm going to gain weight. <laughs> but, you, but you'll enjoy it in a happy way. <laughs> you mentioned the Oka before, and that's mm-hmm. on my list here, Oka with cashew and chipotle sauce. Can you just talk a little bit about this tuber a little bit more? Yes. Well, this is, you know, this was this is pushing the frontiers because Oka isn't available commercially in Britain. But what's fascinating is that it, people can grow it here. You know, so I could be, growing if I had an allotment or vegetable garden. I do try and grow vegetables in my garden, but the slugs and snails just beat me. They sort of worn me down over the years, but I just eat them every time I try to grow anything edible. But I will, perhaps I'll try again. But Oka just is this very interesting, we wanted it in the book because it was grown at 
because they have it at the kitchen gardens at Kew and it's got a lot of potential so it's that interesting thing of putting in the book because it means that you know in you know in x years time when you know our reliance on the potato as the Irish potato famine so tragically brought home how dangerous it is to have them to be dependent on one crop you know and a crop that's set to blight and you know the world we're full it's full of diseases you know the Cavendish banana which is the variety that replaced the, the I think it was the Petit Miguel or Petit Michel variety before but you know it's now under threat and it's clones it can never develop resistance so which is again why Q are doing research into crop wild relatives of bananas so ochre is seen as an alternative to potato because potato is so susceptible to blight, and this is really serious, you know. So we, so we need this tube, and it's and it's very it's known in Peru. So that recipe is from a, a Peruvian, an amazing Peruvian man called Martin Morales, who championed Peruvian food in London. Um, he set up a restaurant called Ceviche, and then another one called Andino, which did a brilliant job of sort of, pop, of you know, we don't know a lot about Peruvian food in Britain. So he did a really good job of sort of promoting it and, and not just, and for him, Martin, it's lovely. It's not just about, it's about food and culture and the music and the history and he brings them all together. And he's done a lot. He's, I think he came over to, I think his parents left Peru for political reasons and he came over since he was 11 and spent a lot of time sort of spreading knowledge about Peruvian culture because we know so little about it. Um, yeah, so it's really lovely to have that recipe in the book. Well, it's made with cashew and chipotle sauce. And I just want to comment that we have a chipotle sauce recipe. Our chipotle sauce is made with cashew cream, which yes. is just cashews and water. And so when I saw that your oka is with cashews, but the cream, of course, in your recipe is dairy-based, but you can make it with cashew cream. And it's yeah. a chipotle with cream is just the best sauce. Lovely, delicious, and I want some. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best sauce. We're moving to the fungarium now which may be my favorite place. Founded in 1879, houses Q's reference collection of fungi, estimated at 1.25 million dried specimens. This collection is the largest in the world and also one of the oldest and most scientifically important. I believe that mushrooms are going to save the planet if we are to be saved. Yeah, they're pretty remarkable, aren't they? Again, we're, we're sort of realizing these complex webs they form and how much other, you know, how trees are dependent on them and use them and these whole sort of, you know, underneath in the ground, you know, these mushrooms are at work and we, yeah, it's the whole, there's so many fascinating books and sort of films appearing now about fungi in this rich, complex world. And it's like revelation, mind blowing. Yeah, we might learn too how to communicate better from be mushrooms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mushrooms and, and trees, yes. there's this whole network of communication underground <laughs> yeah which is pretty and, i mean what's fascinating about that and even q's huge collection is just a fraction we're just scratching the, the fungi surface basically you know i think that's what you know what you realize is how little we know about the even though we you know we think we know so much and actually we know so little as human beings and there's a nature has so much in in it that we understand so little about it and we just need you know not to destroy it mindlessly. We need to work to understand it and and learn and and you yeah and use all these things. You know, like you know, they are mushrooms that will be able to to eat. You know, plastics. You know what? You know, well, our world is drowning in plastic. What's going to solve this? It could be fungi. You know, it's um yeah, they're most remarkable. They have many many powers and. But we need to not destroy everything before we've learned about them. Page 76, steamed mushroom pudding. Oh. Now, the British term pudding is a little different, I think, than what we consider pudding. And I want to talk about the recipe and also about mushroom soy sauce. Okay, so pudding is really interesting because pudding, <laughs> I hadn't really realized until you said that. But yes, pudding has a number of meanings. I think initially in England, it would mean something sweet, but historically, puddings were not necessarily sweet it was more it was that there were steamed puddings that were a shape like a, a ba so I suppose a basin shape and they could be so you have in England we also have savory puddings like steak and kidney pudding is a very famous classic um obviously meat-based pudding and this mushroom pudding recipe is from Thane Prince who's a wonderful British food writer and I and it's very clever because it's taking this very in its savory form that 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 sort of British steam pudding which, which this is one is is often used for meat and Thane has rather brilliantly put mushrooms in it instead and use mushroom soy sauce and that's really interesting because 
that case, but there's this long tradition of, of mushroom condiments in Britain. So, you know, what we call ketchup, as in tomato ketchup, there were those ketchups were sort of preserves that were flavorings, often vinegar based, and they were made from all sorts of things. You had walnut ketchup and you had mushroom ketchup. And so mushroom soy is in this sort of tradition of using like a savory mushroom, mm. yeah, like a condiment, you know. So that's why she's using that in that in that dish. So and what I love about that, what I for me, one of the thrills was being able to have this section because there's six sections in the book and there, there's 67 recipes. So really, let's say, you know, 10 to 11 recipes a, a section, roughly. And then the, but the range is, you know, we've got this very British pudding, but then you've also got Vietnamese fungi summer rolls which is totally different from a totally different tradition you know side by side and I I love that being able to do that with the book to show an open-minded reader you know look there are these all these it's like having um look at some lots of different prisms you know looking at one thing but going you could do that you could do this you could do that have you tried this this would be fun you know and we've got a beautiful recipe from Italy for porcini and lentils you know which is uh, those wonderful Italian Wild mushrooms that are so full of flavour, which are a luxury, really. But a beautiful recipe from Rich Roddy, who's a fantastic, who lives in Rome and, is a, and writes about Italian food beautifully. So it's just, yeah, it was very exciting to have that contributors of that calibre bringing all these different aspects to, to each section. Well, for those who have been socialised to consume burgers and fries, or perhaps fried fish and chips, fish and chips, and are very limited in the variety of food when... You propose that they eat more plant foods and they can't imagine what that would be like and think that it's very boring. This book obviously shows that it is far more interesting and far more fascinating than the diets of most people in the Western world. Yeah, thank you. I, I do. I really think that. I mean, I, you know, plants are remarkable and and the way that we, and humans are very clever, you know, we're a very ingenious species, as well as being a very stupid species in a way. And we're ingenious when it comes to food. And we, we've, you know, we have, you know, think of chocolate and how it comes from cacao and how we, you know, how it's what a remarkable food that is, the journey that's gone on to get to what we eat and take for granted. And really, it's just about sort of, I think we discovered, I wanted, what I wanted in this book was to rediscover that sort of pleasure and the excitement of, of plants. And, and they're just, you know, they're under our noses, we're surrounded by them. They're there in our kitchen in many, many forms. And, and as you say, absolutely delicious. And I think the recipes do prove that. They are one, and I, this is based on, you know, my own experience, they're absolutely delicious recipes. So yeah, I, I do hope they encourage people to, to widen their plant horizons. I'm going to wrap this up with one last recipe in your fruits and nuts section, which is on page 91, the cocoa hazelnut tray bake with espresso Swiss meringue. Now the combination of chocolate and coffee is just fabulous. But what excites me personally is that about seven years ago, the vegan world exploded with the discovery of aquafaba, mm. which is the bean water from yeah. chickpeas or white beans. And we can now make meringue. And I've made many a Swiss meringue from bean water. Personally, I think it's better than egg white meringue. Whereas I used to just ignore recipes like this, now I can celebrate them and make them. That's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And we have got a recipe that uses aquafaba um, from Chantelle Nicholson, who's a chef in London with a, a wonderful um, restaurant called Apricity, which is predominantly plant based, but not totally. And she uses, yeah, that was a lovely, it's a foraged blackberry and fig leaf syrup cake, which is absolutely delicious. Yeah, and that uses aquafaba, which, as you say, it is brilliant, isn't it? That, yeah, all those meringue recipes are now can be veganized. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jenny, Jenny Linford, the editor of the Q Gardens Cookbook, I want to thank you so much for joining me. I just had, I wanted to say one more thing. I live in Forest Hills in New York City. Uh -huh. the, next, the next neighborhood is called Q Gardens. Oh, wow. That's wonderful. I'm really pleased. Right next door. Nothing like what I imagine Kew Gardens in Great Britain is like. Well, I hope you enjoy your visit when you get to, to London. So it is thank the you. most amazing place. But no, thank you for your time. It's been, I've yes. loved our conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you for this journey very much. Bye, bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining me on It's All About Food. I'm Karen Hartglass. You can find me at info at realmeals.org. Everyone have a delicious week.